Welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show on 94.7 The Pulse. Music, interviews, news and, well, two blokes chatting. Now, here are the two blokes. That's a fella called Normie Rowe and uh, he had lots of hits. He's... uh that one out of 1967, I think. Uh, it's not easy. Um, I tell you who knows a bit about Normie Rowe, and that's the bloke on the phone at the moment. Uh, his name is Normie Rowe. Uh, good morning to you, Normie. Yeah, but can you rely on what he says? <laughs> well, it's not easy. Um, <laughs> but don't you worry about that, Grant and I. We're shaking all over. I've run out. That's it. I'm, I'm done. Enough puns. It ain't necessarily so, though. Oh, no, well played, sir. <laughs> you must know his music really, really well. Hey, Normie, thanks for joining us. It's great to have a chat to you as part of our Legends of Australian Music series, which we're kind of developing over uh, on the radio here. Um, we do have uh, a, a, a concert slash performance coming up soon, which is the part, primary reason we're having a chat. But let's kick it off by going back to the boy who went to Northcote High School. Um, where did it all start in terms of your music career? I think it probably started almost when I dropped out the chute. Um, my my parents used to take the, all take the three kids to what they called social evenings. Oh yes, um, at the local cricket club and the various other things. And the kids always went when they got tired. They went to sleep under the table. Mum and Dad were wonderful ballroom dancers. The band lineup consisted of a piano, saxophone, and drums. Uh, but I was immediately taken by this, I guess, of this live music, and I, I've never stopped. I can't stand backing tracks. I think it's cheating. I can't stand tribute shows who don't pay royalties to the people they're paying t- tribute to. Um, I, j- I like people to be upfront and honest with their music, and that's where it was for me. As time went on, of course, uh, you know, I, I started learning to to sing songs at home with my mum, who was a wonderful singer. Uh, And uh, we always, it it was a very outgoing, gregarious household. We always had stuff going on. There were parties on Saturday nights, or there there were uh, Sunday afternoon barbecues, raising money for the blind babies and Austin Hospital Appeal uh, for 3KZ, and all sorts of stuff that uh, I I think... um, you know, inspired me to want to be doing that. Uh, when I got up on stage for the first time, I guess I was three. <laughs> I, I got a round of applause. <laughs> no, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> You've been standing on stage ever since, waiting for the applause. Pretty much, pretty much. So, early doors, who were your uh, your main influences in terms of the... You know, if you wanted to be that singer when you grew up, who was it going to be? Oh, well, look, you know, like I said, Mum was a wonderful singer and she... She'd be singing people, uh, mostly um, mostly female artists like Patsy Cline and Kitty Callan, um, all, all of the ones who are having uh, Doris Day, of course, um, and all all of those female artists. Uh, but there was there was always some uh, some seventy eight records being played in the background, and uh, so that that's pretty much where I got my. Uh, early inspiration and then as I started to discover artists of course for me Ray Charles at mm-hmm. 12 when I saw Ray Charles for the first time at Festival Hall and I was just astounded it was just the most amazing concert so um, then you know obviously I, I used to sing walking around the house and no one ever applauded incidentally but uh, I never made the leap into being uh, you know a, a professional singer how did you get to that work that part of the world I guess I wanted to do it so badly I you know uh, uh, my brother bought a guitar and he, he wasn't doing so well at it so he said would you like the guitar and I said oh well, yeah please <laughs> then I pestered mum and she got me uh, guitar lessons at the Victoria Banjo Club in Swanston Street in Melbourne, and I'd be up there. I, I, I guess I might have been around about ten, getting the tram from Northcote to um, uh, from Northcote into the city with my guitar, and then I'd come out after the my uh, lessons with forty other kids trying to learn the guitar, and uh, have a malted milk and some chips on the way home. 
So it, that would have been a big night out for any 10-year-old. <laughs> Now, Normie, I'm, of course, uh, fascinated by uh, Elvis Presley and, and do a radio show about him. And I'm often talking to people back then about what was life back in the 50s, like 60s, before Elvis hit. But what was it like back in those days and, you know, leading into Johnny O'Keefe and Australian music taking off? Well, I've got to say that my perception of, uh, uh, especially people, uh, early people like Elvis, Grant, um, you know, it was very different from anything I've seen portrayed. I couldn't sit through that whole Elvis movie, I've got to say. It just, you know, like Baz Luhrmann <laughs> to answer for and a lot of stuff, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't see that, you know. Uh, of course, I never ever saw Elvis live, but uh, there are plenty of uh, video things about him, um, and they they are very different from what you see people trying to be and, and make themselves out to be, you know. I, di I have been to Gracelands, and I was really excited to go there. That was quite amazing. I recorded in the studio opposite Gracelands, Can't Help Falling In Love With You. Um, and, uh, oh, what else? You know, Presley was, was the centerpiece, I guess. But so, so too were people like um, uh, people like Chuck Berry and uh, and Little Richard. I always I would just admired Little Richard's voice. I thought, well, how do you sing like that? Uh, of course, there there were lots of other people. Um, you know, Big Joe Turner. I loved uh, Bill Haley and the Comets. Pretty much styled themselves after the music of Big Joe Turner with. Um, you know, things like Shake, Rattle and Roll and Rock Around the Clock, those sort of songs. But uh, to me, um, the whole industry was very different than it's ever been depicted in later years. I mean, uh, Happy Days to me was laughable. <laughs> <laughs> and it, there's, there was so much about, uh, about historical depictions. I can't even go and see them because it, it's different. Um, Johnny, I, I was listening the other day to She's My Baby came on the radio and I was listening to it and I thought, that is a hell of a record mm. in any era. Uh, you know, the recording of that, the arrangement, O'Keefe singing, the whole box and dice, that was uh, a definitive recording. Um, and so too were things like... Uh, I Found a New Love by Lonnie Lee and, uh, of course, the songs of, of, of Colin Jacobson, One Cold Joy. They were, they were all, when you listen to them, they, they're pretty much set in, set in time, but yet timeless. I guess the other thing, Normie, is, and you would have obviously run into this when you were, you know, coming up through the ranks and becoming as big as you were. Uh, there's a band coming out of Liverpool called the Beatles. They had a bit of an impact on the world at that stage. And I guess, you know, if you go to any TV show or whatever, uh, the dramatisation of a, an early 60s, they're going to have Beatles on the t uh, on the radio rather than a Cold Joy or a Johnny O'Keefe. And yet their music was just fantastic, wasn't it? Well, yeah, I mean... <laughs> I hate saying I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, we assume you do mean. <laughs> uh, uh, look, the, the Beatles were essentially a cover band when they first started, mm. as were the Rolling Stones. Uh, people forget that. But then they, then they met the... Uh, the um, just one second, I've got to get rid of that echo. <laughs> then they met... Uh, George, um, George Martin, mm. who I think inspired them to write a lot more. Yep. Oh, we still got you there. We thought we might have lost you. Uh, no, now we've got you now. It's all good. Go on the line now, unfortunately. No, that's okay. Um, so um, you were obviously, you know, 65, 66. That's where you, your career took off and we started to hear you on the radio. Well, I did and I was a bit young for that, but, you know, metaphorically speaking. Um, how did you get into a recording contract? And, 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 you know, obviously you went from being the kid from Northcote High School to being the king of pop in Australia. That must have been uh, pretty hard to come to terms with. Well, I was 13 years old and I was playing at a... 
concert at Toowoomba for my then music school after I finished with the the uh, after I'd finished with the um, banjo club. Sorry, banjo club. Yep. I went on to the Lutapano Music School, and uh, they had a concert for Moomba on the back of a truck. And the comp here was Stan Rofe from 3KZ. Mm -hmm. And after I'd finished my set with the band, um, uh, he said to me, have you got any aspirations of being a singer? And I said, oh, that's all I want to do. And he said, that's good. That's what I wanted to hear. Um, Come into the radio station on Tuesday, which I did. Uh, he went to put me on the air, but I was gobsmacked. I couldn't speak. <laughs> then he um, he took me to Preston Town Hall on the following Saturday night, and that's where it all began for me. You know, he tried to get me a recording contract with uh, EMI, but the people in Sydney said, "No, he can't sing." Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that became a very contentious thing after. After the first number one, <laughs> <laughs> a bit like the guy from Decca who said the Beatles they weren't we weren't going to sign the Beatles because guitar bands were a thing of the past. Yeah, yeah. I re- listen. I remember the uh, the music director of um, of Three X Y when John Farnham put out a David Cassidy cover. Uh, and, and mind you, a better recording. <laughs> that Johnny Farnham, he's already had his shot. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's a when, <laughs> that comes out of the famous last words heading, doesn't it? That one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously, a lot has been spoken about over the journey uh, and your time being in national service and then heading off to Vietnam. Obviously, impacting on your career. When you look back on that time, is it bitterness? Is it anger? Is it uh, pride? What what? How do you feel about that period of your life? Oh, look. Uh, I, you can't change anything in the past. You have to accept what is and what was. Mm-hmm. So, um, it, just about in every every experience that I've ever had, there's been, you know, there's been a downside, but there's mostly been upsides from it. So, um, I've, I've been very fortunate to have. I've got the best friends both in the music industry and the ex service community. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's good to hear because, you know, I think, it, you know, your, your career took a, a big turn. There were some conversations about whether or not uh, the government may have had something to do with that mm. happening. Um, and yet to come out the other side of it, uh, you know, and being really positive about how you're working with veterans and, and the service you provide to them is, is just exceptional, I think. Yeah, well, I had another event last night in Ballina where I was able to, um, well, I was asked to do the... Uh, uh, after dinner um, address uh, and it was fantastic to think that I was able to lend something to such an amazing organisation there's a, a 100th anniversary of the beginning of Legacy and um, uh, that, to celebrate that there's a torch relay that started in France and went to the UK. It was given royal assent by King Charles. Now down in Australia, it's went gone through, right through. It went from Western Australia up to Darwin, and Darwin across to Cairns, down the eastern seaboard. Um, Brian Cad, Denise Drysdale, and myself carried the torch through the Gold Coast. Went down through Lismore and went, and it was in Ballina yesterday. I don't know where it is today, but it's heading further south, and I'm sure you'll see it in Geelong. Uh, in the next few weeks. Excellent. And getting through Lismore and having your feet dry, that's unusual. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's very dry these days, tell <laughs> you. Well, Normie, can I ask you about uh, some of uh, the recordings? You mentioned at the start about, you know, not like backing tracks and things like that, and, you know, today's artists record five seconds, but you obviously recorded live. How different was that? Oh, look, it was, it was very different. I, I mean, when we first started recording... Um, we only recorded on single, single track machines and they were dubbed from one to the other. So we, we record uh, maybe uh, four instruments and then mix it down onto, uh, onto uh, an, 
uh, or have it ready mixed so that when we're recording onto another single track machine, they'd be working off that backing track we've just recorded. So, um, and I know that sounds like, I guess, what I was saying before, but at least we played the stuff. <laughs> you created the backing track. That's a bit different. And it, and it was the only way you could do it in those days, too. So we did dubbing, you know, dubs and all that sort of thing. I mean, we had a 12-voice choir on it, ain't necessarily so. Um, and we had uh, uh, the... the, the the uh, the band the instrumentation wasn't particularly big, but it was it was um, very very professionally done. We had uh, the engineer was Bill Armstrong, and uh, the producer was Pat Alton, who went on to record or record some of Australia's greatest uh, jingles, things like Wheat Bix Kids and um, and. Uh, we're going on a magic carpet ride. There's a Coca-Cola thing that went international. You know, I mean, we were doing great stuff. Uh, and then, of course, um, wasn't too long after that, the multi-track recording became a thing. Well, I'm a big fan of you know recording on the spot. I, I I think that's amazing, and I think Australia should be really proud of their music industry because you know a lot of songs like yours they still stand the test of time. And you know, like you were talking about. She's my baby. So we've, we've got to celebrate these Australian musicians, haven't we? Yeah, that's dead right. That's yeah. right. Um, well, we, we should um, get around to talking about why you're in Geelong soon, but um, we, we should also acknowledge the fact a lot of people I, I spoke to during the week, I tell people who we're going to have on the show, like, oh, Nomi Rose, great singer in the 60s. You've done so much more than that in the entertainment industry. I mean, uh, you're acting uh, with, uh, obviously, you're in Sons and Daughters for a while. Uh, you did rave reviews about your work in Les Miserables and um, you know it's such a multifaceted uh, artist and you had a lot of people just associate you with music if you had to do one thing for the rest of your life uh, theatre on stage musical stuff or recording pop songs what would you go with? I'm I'm pretty sure I go with musical theatre I I love being in the theatre environment to me it's uh, it, it feels the most comfortable for me, but uh, I just enjoy the live thing, you know, just being, and I, I guess it's immediate immediate gratification. Yeah, and and I guess the fact that you get into some, I would call it performance fitness, you know, you're doing it seven or eight times a, a week and getting into the same kind of um, mindset. Yeah, I think I was better... Uh, uh, been uh, for what I was doing probably the best uh, shape physical shape as a singer that I possibly could be but uh, uh, yeah it, 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 there is that definitely I, I didn't like the fact that I had to come off this um, off the stage once a week to let the understudy go on <laughs> broke my stride Nothing, nothing. There was nothing professional or no, nothing unprofessional about it at all. But I, I just the minute that my stride was broken, it, it was that much harder to get back up to scratch. Well, I've got Rob texting me saying, "Don't let Grant near the microphone again," for exactly the same reason. Rob thinks he's coming back next Saturday, but he's not. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Don't never let your understudy go on. That's right. No, absolutely not. So uh, we are excited to say that you are coming to Geelong uh, next week. Um, but, of course, we've also got um, listeners up in Melbourne. So I'm just bringing up your website. You're at the Shopo. Uh, please, when you get on stage, call it by its correct name, the Shopo, won't you? Not the Shopping Town Hotel. Uh, that's next uh, Friday night, Saturday night, Saturday night. <laughs> uh, the Shopping Town is Friday. Friday. And the, the Sphinx. Yes. Which is an interesting place because I've seen the real Sphinx. <laughs> Wait till you see it, Normie. <laughs> it's a beauty. <laughs> now, we should play a quick game of pop, uh, pop trivia here. What is the most significant aspect of the Sphinx in Australian music history? Ooh, stunned silence. It used to be known as the Golf Links Hotel many years ago. And a band called Mississippi turned up one night and said, you know what, we're now going to call ourselves Little River Band. That's fantastic. So there you go. So you could get up on on Saturday night and say, I'm now going to call myself Werribee. Did you know, though, that they needed to change the band because it wasn't... Uh, Mississippi was essentially a three-piece band. Mm. 
And by the time they got everybody together, it was a much bigger band. They said, what are we going to call ourselves? And as they were going to that gig at the Golf Links Hotel, they went past Little River and said, that sounds like a good name for a band. We'll call ourselves the Little River Band. Which is so much better than the North Shore or Corio Band, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yes. Or the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Truganina band. Everyone's standing around wondering whether it's Truganina or Truganina. The Darwin ba- Brothers, your <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> now, you, you're not just going to front up there by yourself. You've got a sidekick who's going to be singing with you. Ah, oh, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> she's more than a sidekick, <laughs> I tell you. Denise Drysdale and I go back in to teenage years, and uh, we, we have a fantastic rapport. We... We, we love being in each other's company and we, we just, I admire what she does on stage and she keeps telling everybody I'm singing better than I ever have, which is a bit dubious, but uh, she's, um, you know, she, it's, it's total insanity. When she goes on stage, it's total insanity. So, um, I've had the good fortune to see her on stage actually a few years ago when she had uh, those shows with Ernie Sigley, and that's the classic Australian pairing. And mm. I can imagine the fun that Normie and Denise would be having. So, uh, that's a fantastic get along. When's it on, Neil? It, it's on on su- Saturday next week. Is it Saturday night, presumably, Normie? Yes, Saturday, Saturday evening. Yes, so if you were to uh, contact the Sphinx, I'm sure you'd be able to get tickets. Although, I'm looking at your website. And under where it says the Sphinx, it says buy tickets. So I'm assuming if I press that button, I could buy the tickets at the cleverly named normyrow.com. It must have taken you a while to come up with that website. Yeah. And for p- people who are listening in other places, uh, he's going to be at the Etalogger Diggers, and I'm assuming with Denise in all these events. Yes, that's right. We've got, we've got a whole run going on at the moment. Yep, so Etalong Beach in New South Wales, Taree in New South Wales, uh, Lazotte's at uh, Newcastle, and then you're back in Melbourne. It's sold out at the Hyatt RSL in August, Penrith. Yes. Shoal Bay, Loriton, in you are going to be all over the place like a mad woman's breakfast. Yep. Outstanding. Nomi, we are so thrilled to have had the opportunity to chat with you, a, a living legend of the Australian music industry. Thanks for taking some time out on your Saturday morning. You sound like you've been busy while you've been talking to us. Uh, and we'll get along, hopefully, and see you at the Sphinx next Saturday night. I look forward to seeing you both, Neil, Grant. Thanks very much for your time. No worries at all. Normie Rowe, superstar of Australian music, thanks for being on the Two Blacks Chatting Radio Show.